As you know, the Rich Dad Radio Show is we're all about financial education, but not that crap that most people get over the television or in schools and all this stuff. So you'll be learning some further distinctions on financial education. And we have a very special guest that will bring, you know, the issue of why it's important, why financial education is important as early as possible. And we have a former NFL player, Ryan Broyles. He played for the Detroit Lions. He was Rookie of the Year in 2012, played uh, college football at the University of Oklahoma, first team All Big 12, 2011. And he's a two-time All-American. It's something I never <laughs> I played football, but I was on the bench most of the time. <laughs> anyway, the, the whole thing here uh, is this, is that he's extremely successful, but as you know, w- with professional athletes, your career, their careers are opposite most of us. For example, Ryan will make most of his money early in life and less later, and hopefully regular people will make more money the older they get. But as, to, as you know, today, in today's economy, the old guys are getting wiped out too. So it's a very important show. And also joining us is John McGregor, dear friend, fellow rugby player from Hawaii. And he's a certified financial planner. He's the only one we allow on our program. And he's going to be talking about the importance of planning and education and some distinctions of why your education, financial education, is more important than what you invest in. Any comments, Kim? Yes. Well, I mean, we are the good news and bad news about money. And a lot of times we've been talking about a lot of the bad news because the economy and where it's going and things that are happening in the political world. But today we're going to talk about the good news about money. And we've got this great, great young gentleman here who's a professional football player. And if you're thinking, oh, well, I'm not a professional football player. This doesn't relate to me. Well, a professional football player is also an employee. So as an employee, he's done some incredible things, and you're going to find out what he's done. And and nothing that he's done is anything that you can't do. So I think it's going to be a great fun show. Yeah, so remember, for a guy like Ryan Broyles, his career is opposite of most of ours. In theory, he makes most of his money when he's young. And a lot of the guys don't have money when they're old. They're professional athletes. And John McGregor is going to be talking to all of us about why it's not so much what you invest in, but your plan to be an investor. So welcome to the program, both Ryan and John. Hey, Ryan. Hey, hey, how you doing? Thanks for having me. Thank you. Hey, John. Hey, hi, guys. Great to be with you again. So you have have new books coming out in 2016, John? Yes, absolutely. We should have the first draft done in three months. Great. So we're we're wrapping it up. Yep. Very, Very happy because, like I said, John is a dear friend from Hawaii, but he's about the only financial planner I let near our show. Not that they're bad people, but today you're going to find out some of the distinctions between financial planners and rich young guys like Ryan and Kim and I, and what really is financial education. So, uh, Ryan, let's start with you. Give us a little of your background on how you became an NFL player. Ah, well, I've, I've been playing football for a long time. I guess sports at that for a long time. Started at eight years old playing flag football in the tackle. I was, was always this, a, was this in Oklahoma. In Oklahoma, yeah, Norman, Oklahoma. So did you have a pro contract at eight? <laughs> no, I was working on it then. Though, I'll tell you that. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, the reason I ask you that is Kim and I are now hearing they should play pay college players early. I'm going. Yeah, that's touchy, but I, I can see I mean, why they think that's that. Not the, that's not you know what the heck. Well, you definitely want to work for the pros, but those yeah, college but, those colleges are making a killing off yeah. of athletes, you know, and a lot of those guys do not make it to the league to make the money. So, when, I think you should yeah. reward some of them. When when you were eight, was it was it a goal of yours to be a, a, a when I was eight years old, player? I wanted to be the next Emmett Smith. Ah. Yeah, I did. Ah. I that. Yeah, so that, and then in basketball, I wanted to be the next Kobe Bryant. Um, so my whole life, it was pretty much sports. Football. Um, it was football, yeah. And you so went to college at? At Oklahoma oh, University. Okay. Yep. Did, you, did, you ever, did you ever play baseball, too? I played one year um, and almost got hit by the ball, and I was like, yeah. <laughs> I, was in, I think I was in seventh grade, and I was like, this is not for me, you know. But you looking got, you back got, on it, it'd be sweet. You almost got hit by a baseball, but then you go into football and get smashed. <laughs> yeah, but it's not like someone's throwing a ball. I, le- I can at least juke somebody in football. <laughs> baseball, you just stand there and hope the ball doesn't hit you. So. And so what position did you play <laughs> um, for? Receiver. I played receiver, receiver at OU, yep, and then Detroit Lions are obviously the receiver. I, I just got to ask. I just tell you, my, my friend says every guy wants to be the wide receiver. Without a doubt, you want to score Everybody. You want to score touchdowns. Yeah, actually, <laughs> coming out of high school, I was re- highly recruited for defensive back. Um, and so when it came down to it, I had offers from a lot of schools at receiver and cornerback. 
And I was like, what What will make more sense? Who will Who will love me more? How will I be more most famous? The chicks like wide and, receivers. And we want than... touchdowns. You know what I mean? Yeah, right. the, the team will cheer if you have an interception, but I yeah. want to score touchdowns. So I was like, I'm going to be a receiver. <laughs> and they boo you if you miss the guy coming and scores a touchdown. Well, that, that, and they boo you if you drop the ball, too. So I try not to do that. So I got to ask, <laughs> at, at Oklahoma University, did, did, they, did you take any financial education courses? Did they teach financial education? No, they no. did not. No. You know, oh, Not even in high school, you know. Um, it's kind of one of those things I just kind of learned on my own. You know, the the big turning point in my life was when in 2012 I got drafted by the Detroit Lions in the second round. Um, they sent all the rookies to something they call the Rookie Symposium yes. in um, Ohio. And that was really the first time I heard about financial education. And they were talking about how all these athletes go bankrupt. Yes. And so I went home, and I tell this story all the time. I went home and I Googled what do rich people do. And they invest in the stock market and real estate. And the first book that it popped up on real estate was – Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad Poor Dad. Oh, really? So I grabbed that book, okay, yeah, great, and I started great, taking great. notes. I actually have a book. It's not this one right here, but I have notes for days on that and an unfair advantage and YouTube hours. and. So, so what, what year was that? 2012. And today in 2016, you're financially free? Financially free. I am. Amazing. It How is old awesome. Are you? How old are you? 27. All you old guys yeah. out there, listen to that. But right? Yeah, but so uh, obviously so I, I, I walked into a lot of money as well. Um, I guess – for a 25 year old, it's a lot yeah, of money. Of you know, I had a, a nice signing bonus. Yeah. And so um, I could either go blow it, go buy this, this, and that. Which and most so, do. Yeah. And I put myself, yeah. me and my wife, on a budget. Um, and that's really so how what things color started. Did you buy? <laughs> <laughs> my first, I actually kept my car from college. It was a Trailblazer I bought in. 2007 wow. and i still have Good it to this you. day yep. you know when you and you when you rent, went as a rookie to this symposium yes did they teach you anything about money or did they just tell you that most go broke and so pay attention yeah it was kind of like a scare fact like they, it's just listen these people are going to come after your money um and you're a lot of these guys go bankrupt and that was basically it. that was it so it was basically it was up to you to yeah it was kind of like they were trying to, yeah make you nervous not huh. to go and do this you know and even before i got drafted Agents were giving guys money to go and spend on watches, and I was like, I don't need any agents of that. Are, I was scared. Agents, yeah. are some, agents are some of the worst, right? Yeah, but there's good agents. I, I know, actually but, have a good agent, too. And, and, um, and so speaking about guys who come after the money, we have John McGregor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here from the dark side. <laughs> hey, and John and I are rugby players, uh, but John, did you ever play football, gridiron? Oh, yeah, I I grew up playing football. My goal was to play in the National Football League. I, admi- I was a defensive end. I admired guys like Richard Dent and, uh, and Howie Long. Those are the guys uh-huh. that I idolized. So, John, what, what do you have to say for people like Ryan? Or, uh, do you see that when somebody has a lot of money or whatever the case is, the financial planner steps in or a salesman steps in or something? Oh, yeah. I mean, first of all, when I got the email about this show, I was extremely excited because this topic is very near and dear to my heart. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I've worked with a lot of athletes both active and inactive meaning in their retirement and it's absolutely tragic what's going on to these guys what, what's happening well well like like hit. like like one of our one of our great friends who just passed away right i mean broke all nfl yeah, I, pro I, I i i didn't know his particular financial situation but but I, you know it's a struggle and you're essentially handing a four-year-old a loaded handgun that's what you're doing when you're giving young people, 18, 19, 20-year-old uh, men, a uh, million dollars to go do whatever they want. What, ha- what ends up happening very quickly is this big bullseye emerges on their back. Friends, family, neighbors, uh, agents, as we talked about, financial advisors, salespeople, um, nonprofit organizations, they all emerge because they want a piece of that pie. It's a, it's a really challenging uh, situation for these guys. They're very busy doing their work. I mean, they got to make the team. And so there's a lot of pressure there. But to hear Ryan's story is absolutely incredible because he is definitely the ano- anomaly here. Right. So when, you know, when uh, we were working with the NBA the, and they brought us in to talk to the young guys, what they, what this, what they said to the NBA players is the moment you sign that contract, you're the best looking guy on campus. <laughs> <laughs> every, every woman's going to be after <laughs> yeah. you. So that, that happened to you Absolutely. too? Absolutely. 
Well, I was I was married. Oh, I, I got oh. I got married. Oh, I actually was I've been with my wife for eleven years now. We oh, met in great. high school. Oh, great! Boy, you're um, really an anomaly. Yeah, you are. <laughs> I grew up in a small town, Norman, Oklahoma. You know, I you found the good, love of my life early. You know, good parents with good values. Great, yeah, great parents, hardworking yeah, parents. Yeah, good so, good um, values. About. And I think the rich dad poor dad kind of relates to to my side as well. You know, my parents worked hard. You know, get a good education. Right. Um, but then person. there was nothing about financial independency or even college at that. So the first right. time I heard about college was in ninth grade. Had a coach come up to me and say, hey, Ryan, if you keep playing the way you do, you're going to get a college education. Wow. Oh, and that's all I needed to hear. Wow. Free education. Let's do it. You know. <laughs> so, John, a lot of times as a financial planner, you work with the old guys like me who are at the end of their lives, but they haven't, you know, they, they weren't pro athletes, but they really mm -hmm. have nothing at the end of their lives anyway, right? Yeah. Yeah, no question. I mean, I I think the, the best example um, and probably the biggest lesson in all of this are from those clients that I've worked with that finished their career, and now they look back and all, 100% of them have said their biggest regret was not taking control of their finances early when they had the money. 100% of them will tell you that their life would be so different today if they had managed that money earlier. Because now they're working in a job that didn't pay anywhere near what they were they were getting paid as a professional athlete, and now they're just scraping by. To, well, not, uh, well, not even professional up. athletes. There's a lot of guys who work yeah. all their lives with nothing anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? Oh, absolutely. Same example applies. Yep. So are you, yeah. are you right. finding that these people are going to have to keep working and working and working and working? They're not going to be able to retire? Absolutely. No, yep. they're, they're going to vote for Bernie people. Sanders, and then they're going to be free. They'll be free. <laughs> hey, once again, it's Robert it's Kiyosaki, different. the Rich Dad Radio Show, the good news and bad news about money. Our two special guests today are Ryan Broyles, former NFL player, Detroit Lions, Rookie of the Year 2012, and dear friend John McGregor, fellow, fellow Hawaiian, certified financial planner. His new book is coming up, The New Science of Financial Transformation, coming out in 2016. If you listen to the show again, you'll learn twice as much. But most importantly today, if you have some young people in your household or your family who want to turn pro and become a professional athlete and make a lot of money, this is your show. So that person needs to listen to this program because, as we say at Rich Dad, money doesn't make you rich. Financial education makes you rich. So our two guests today are Ryan Broyles, former NFL player for the Detroit Lions, rookie of the year in 2012, played college football at the University of Oklahoma, first team all Big 12, and two times All-American. Man, it doesn't get much better than that. Website is ryanlbroyles.com. And our other guest is John McGregor, a dear friend from Hawaii. He's a certified financial planner. John and I played football. We went on to the greatest sport of all, rugby. <laughs> and he is the author of the upcoming book, The New Science of Financial Transformation. And John is a financial planner. And there's a big difference between a financial planner and a stockbroker. You know, a lot of times financial, people think financial planners are stockbroker, but that's not true. What a financial planner really does, the most important thing, is lays out a plan and then decides what you should invest in or not invest in. Is that correct, John? Absolutely. Yep. And most That's people ninety percent of it. And most people don't yep. really have a plan. That's absolutely correct. And yep. we're talking about it is when you know when you're working in Hawaii, you saw a lot of guys my age, I'm a little bit older than John, but they're at the end of their careers and they don't have anything, right? That's correct. And the other problem is those that do have a plan never look at it again. They never follow it. <laughs> but they get real excited getting that plan together. They got their plan, <laughs> yeah. but they never act on it. They, it's under their arm, and they're just running out my office door. They just can't wait to get started, and then I never see them again. Right. <laughs> and, what, and, John, what age do people usually come to see you at? Oh, it varies, Kim. It's really um, depending on how eager they are to get started. It could be in their first career. And I've worked with people all the way up. They come to me for the first time at age 70. And that's probably the hardest conversation yeah. I have to have. Yeah. And I, because, you know, it's, you can't pull a rabbit out of a hat. And I have to tell them, no, I'm sorry, you cannot retire. Or you're going to have to lower your lifestyle that you anticipated. That's tough. That's a tough conversation. And especially if they, have, if they have to keep working and nobody wants them, you know. That's right. And that's, a lot of times they've retired. Yeah. And that's why. they go out and find a job. Right. You know? And that's why Ryan, who's 27 years old, is a very good example of this is because your professional career, you start early and early. Is that correct? Without a doubt. <laughs> very correct. <laughs> so you, you don't mind telling us what happened uh, 
Like yeah, last book? last year, El- Ellen, right? The t- yeah. TV show Ellen called. What what? That was a great story. Oh yeah, it was an awesome opportunity. So uh, last year in July, um, I had a reporter come to me um, during camp. Um, I was a, a kind of a wing guy that may make the team, may not make the team. And so a guy came up to me and was like, "What are you gonna do um, if you don't make the team?" And I kind of looked at him and was like, "What do you mean?" He was like, "Well, for money." And then this is how it all started because uh-huh. I got to share my story on the finances of Rich Dad Poor Dad and financial advisors. And then everything blew up at that point. You know, all these different media outlets wanted to take the story and write about so it. And then almost no athlete was doing what you were doing pretty much. Well, publicly, I don't, I'm yeah. not sure. Yeah. Okay. But at that point, um, the story hit and then Ellen approached um, my agent. Um, and so they wanted to figure out, okay, let's get Ryan on the story. And so I'm on the team from June to July. Um, went through a couple interviews, like, hey, we, we got you set up. We're going to do the Ellen show. And then I get released from the Detroit Lions. And a week later, like, we don't, we don't want you anymore. So Ellen, Ellen says, don't come on the show because you're not. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure you're, it wasn't you're just you're Ellen. You're a former but, player. Yeah. So this is what drives me crazy. <laughs> I was like, wow. This would have been the, the best story. It's the story that this needs to be story. heard. And it's not just me. You know, there's a lot of people in those locker rooms people that aren't professional athletes that have these great stories too yeah. but obviously if you're in the public eye you get to yeah, share your I, story i think ellen missed the missed the ticket on this one because this could have been a great educational well, story well i'm, I'm here on rich too. dad poor dad yeah, so, so yeah, yeah we get for that. sure <laughs> so the reason this show is important because here we have john mcgregor as a financial planner and like i said he sees a lot of people at the end of their end of their careers at 70 and then you have ryan broyles who at 27 it's over for until you, if you make unless you make another. And, and now you're going back to to try out all over again, with right? No pressure, without you know, the money just, pressure. Yes, yeah, so I just get to go free. and play football. Yeah, that's without a doubt. fantastic. So if you might explain, how did you become financially free? Um, well, I picked up the Rich Dad Poor Dad book in 2012. Everybody hear that? <laughs> Rich Dad Poor Dad. It, it really <laughs> local bookstore. That was really it. So I'll share my story here quickly again. Um, went to the um, rookie symposium. Um, they talked about finances. Heard about a lot of guys going bankrupt. Um, I. Google instantly, what do rich people do? Um, so invest in real estate, stock market. Robert Kiyosaki's book came up. And how um, did you start? What did you, what start? Did, yeah, what did you start investing in? How did you? Oh, well, I, I, I was the stock market first. Um, then I understood, okay, after I read his book, um, you don't have as much control. So I went head over heels in the real estate game, um, bought a property in my hometown, um, got so, the mailbox money, and I was Oklahoma. like, wow, this really works. So yes, Norman, Oklahoma. Right. And it's how like, many how many properties do you have today? I have forty today. Forty rental properties. Yes. So and when you got cut, you didn't really need the job anymore, did you? No, I wanted the job, but I didn't. Financially, love, I did not meet, need the job. Football. But emotionally, I, I wanted to play, and I still yeah. do want yeah, to play. And, you know yeah. what I mean? And all of you listening out, that is the purpose of the Rich Dad Radio Show. It's not about retiring; it's about being financially free. The problem is a lot of times when you go financially free or you have a lot of money come in, you go nuts. You know, like. It's really strange for me, for myself and Kim right now, to talk to people who still need a job because it's not in our wheelhouse. It's not between our two ears. You know, we would rather have so much money coming in, we don't need a job. Mm-hmm. Yet when you talk to people, they look at you like you're nuts. Well, you have to have a job, right? I mean, but all we did was work our plan. Mm-hmm. And our plan was a very simple plan. Our, our plan from day one was very simple. We, we were going to very simply buy, buy uh, 20 units. 20 rental units, um, two a year. So 10 years, we were going to have 20 units, and that was going to be our retirement. That, mm-hmm. that was going to be our cash flow, and we were going to be financially free. And they were going to amortize, which means we have no debt. In other words, a renter would pay off our debt. Yeah. So we like debt because yeah. mm-hmm. a renter was going to pay it off. It was a very sure. simple plan. For and sure. then once we started to understand it and got more into apartments and things like that, instead of 10 years, it took us 18 months. Yes. But that's just because that's we were so thing. and we were so excited. I mean, it's, we were yeah. so passionate about it. it really we so is. wanted to learn. And uh-huh. um, it, it took us ten years because we didn't make a you know uh, nobody offered me a pro career. Right? <laughs> 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 but anyway, that's and we didn't thing, inherit though. it. Yeah, we you didn't... can start with one and, and yeah, go yeah, from yeah. there. Yeah. Yep. So a lot of people see you don't need all an the, NFL guy that makes them. millions of dollars and like I can't yeah. be that guy. But there's a plan that you can start with one. We started with we started with five thousand dollars. That's what we started with. So once again, it's Robert Kiyosaki of the Rich Chat Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. We have two guests. Today, Ryan Broyles, 27 years old, former NFL player. He just, you know, got cut from the Detroit Lions. He's still, he's still very fit, very active, reapplying for a job, but he doesn't need a job. And also, friend, dear friend John McGregor, certified financial planner, and he's talking about the plan, not the investment. Any comments, John? 
Yeah, and there's no question. It starts with the plan, and that's 90 percent of anyone's <laughs> success in this case. The investments. That's just a byproduct, but where people really need to focus on is, is getting organized, having a budget like Ryan did, and sticking to it. It's really basic blocking and tackling, <laughs> to use the appropriate term here. Um, it's not and, glamorous and, and sexy either. It's kind of monotonous. Not at all. Not, <laughs> yeah, and, not you, at all. and you know, we're, we're talking to Ryan professional football. He made a lot of money. No, no, no. no. But, Wide receiver. There's no wide, sexier, yes, right, right. No sexiest <laughs> position. Quarterback, wide to, receiver. I'd have to agree with that. Yeah, for <laughs> I'd sure. have to agree right, with John? that. Right, <laughs> John? But, but what we're talking about is, is, you know, today with the economy, I mean, people are getting laid off right and left. Mm-hmm. I mean, you got released from the, from the Detroit Lions. People are getting laid off right and left, and most of them are not prepared. You were, you were prepared, so when this came, you were like, oh, it's okay. I'm, I'm financially, I'm free. Now I can just go do what I really want to go do, and now you're going back to football because you love it. I think that's yep. a great story. But most people, they get laid off. They got nothing, yeah. and it's and it's a it's a crisis. It really is. You, you got to start with a plan. Yeah, go ahead, John. I just wanted to ask a question to Ryan. Ryan, is you went through the rookie symposiums and and the scare speeches, and you you heard from other professional athletes that have gone broke, and we all know we all know the statistics. Of, you know, seventy eight percent of NFL players file for bankruptcy within five years. Why did that message at that rookie symposium? resonate with you and not others he's I don't married <laughs> you me? hey my wife did play a big part Is of that the wife? Hey, she did play a big part of that no, john um, john come on come on i mean john has I a problem wait, john, wait, wait. john has his problem too he's not married and, uh, and he knows there's two things married. that drive you crazy money and women and if you're not married and you have money you're in trouble right with that yeah, i'm afraid yeah. of the- yeah, exactly. Well, I'll tell you. I'll tell you one thing. I started working at eight years old. I was mowing lawns um, to support, I guess, uh, my travel for basketball and various sports. Um, and then shortly after that, I started refing basketball games um, in middle school, high school. Um, worked at Homeland, bagging groceries. Um, went to when I went to college, I was working in the summertime, so I always worked and understood money, you know. And so you had I a knew good, good work ethic. Yeah. Well, from my parents, obviously, and the right. people around me. Um, so I was like, okay, once I got this. This money, I've got to make this thing last, yes. you know? Yeah. Yes. So, and then I obviously it starts with the plan. Um, put myself on a budget through my financial advisor. Um, then I, when I knew I had money to invest and things were working well for me, I was like, okay, now it's time for me to jump in and, and grow this. John, don't you wish you had more clients like Ryan? Yeah. <laughs> oh, no question about it. Because I, I, will, I will admit, dealing with professional athletes that are active in the moment, that are still on contract, it's a challenging client to work with for a lot of reasons. They're being hounded by so many different people to get a piece of their money, as we talked about earlier. Plus, every other financial advisor wants to have a professional athlete as a client. It's, it's kind of cachet, if you will. It's also and good so, marketing. So, you know, I have, I have Ryan Rawls market. as my client. Right? Exactly. exactly. <laughs> and so that advisor is going to promise that athlete whatever they want. And right. so invariably, I always get that phone call from, from, mm-hmm. the, from the athlete that I'm working with. It's like, John, I know you don't want to hear this. Just hear me out. I've got the best investment idea, business opportunity that just came across. This is going to work. And somehow it's always a nutritional product. I don't know why. Uh, and do, Ryan, do you, oh, Ryan, wow. do you get pitched a lot of invest? Did you get pitched get on all, investments, when, especially when you were playing? All kinds. Yeah. yeah. People, Still to this day. People, yeah. had, people had a place to spend your money, yeah, right? Yeah, they had a plan for my money. Yeah, for your doubt. money. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> right. But it's this whole concept. The other big concept that, that pro athletes and everyone faces, uh, frankly, but pro athletes Athletes face it probably more than others is this keeping up with the Joneses mentality. You know, they grew up in many cases in modest means and idolizing the celebrities and musicians and other athletes. And when they when they suddenly come across all of this money, they want to live the life of their idols. And that's when the spending kicks in. And it's it's a neurological conversation. You know, we have this situation where we want to be like other people that we admire, and and that ends up driving a ton of bad behavior. I mean, look at. Look at Warren Sapp. He just filed for bankruptcy in 2012, and this is a guy that I loved. He had $6.5 in assets, $6.5 million in debt, and a pair of Air Jordans that were worth $6,500. And I'm thinking, <laughs> why does he need Air Jordans that are $6,500? In a little while, you're going to find out what really constitutes a financial plan. It's not just about real estate or stocks. So that's why our guests today, Ryan Broyles and John McGregor. John McGregor is a financial, certified financial planner. You can contact John at macfinancial at outlook.com, macfinancial at outlook.com, and request his white paper, 
questions to ask, and what to look for when selecting a financial planner. I'll say it again. The plan is more important than what you invest in. So, John, could you give us three or four of the most important things that make up a solid financial plan? Yeah, and this is a great way to start because I think to your point, you're dead on. The investments are secondary. Where people fail and go wrong is not having a, an organized plan to get them through with their, their working years and their retirement years. But the plan is consists of various components, and it, it somewhat depends on who you are and what stage of life you're in. But if I want to boil it down, really, something that's all-encompassing for, every, for everyone, first, it's organization. That's where most people go wrong. People typically come to me with a junk drawer full of financial products and services that they've purchased over time. They are completely unorganized. And by the way, this isn't really a plug, but Rich Dad Organization just came out with a great uh, tool to help you organize all your finances called uh, Getting Your House Financial House in Order. I, sh- so I should use that myself. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what you're saying yeah. when you say organize, it's like finding out where you are, what you've got, where it is. Yeah, All of that. it's kind of yeah, what? and thanks, thanks, Kim. It's kind of what I call practical awareness. Knowing a lot of people don't even know how much money they're bringing in, they or, certainly or what don't they're know spending. how much money is going out. Right, yeah, right. exactly. They don't know how much they're paying for their insurance policy. I hear all the time, well, I think I'm paying seven hundred dollars a year, and it's for a three hundred. They don't really understand. They don't know their credit score. They don't know their tax bracket. So there's a lot of practical awareness that just goes on with knowing money coming in and money going out, and, and why um, and for what purpose is that money going out for. The other part is having a budget. I mean, that's absolutely critical. You know, again, blocking and tackling, it's very basic, but it's super, super important. I think this is why Ryan has been so successful in his own life. It really started with having a disciplined budget. I like to break down a budget just for general terms, call it 50, 20, 30 plan. 50 refers to 50% should be going to fixed costs. That would be your, your housing, your utilities, your car payments, your Netflix, your gym membership. Then the 20% would be your financial goals. And that would I would consider putting at least 20% of your take-home pay towards sort of a long-term plan. And then the last part of your budget would be your flexible spending. That would be 30%. That's your groceries, uh, shopping, hobbies entertainment and gas. So 50, 20, 30 is a great rule of thumb. So, so let me ask, let, last, hang, hang, let yeah. me ask Ryan for a second. So you, when you were doing your plan, um, you decided you were going to put yourself on your own budget, right? And you were making a lot of money. What was your, what was your budget? My budget was 5,000, but um, I did not start out with that number. My finance advisor said, okay, listen, you've got this money, go live your life as you would. And over three, four months, I was hitting 5000 So that's how I made my budget So you 5, put 000. your budget, so 60000 a year. That yeah, now your, if it was okay. 10000 then at that point, I would know what I had left to invest. Got it. But it was 5000 so mm-hmm. then I, I could invest yeah. a little bit more. So he didn't try and cramp your living style. No, I, I think it's – you, you want I don't think you want to go and press the issue first. You want them to live their life. You don't want them to feel restricted. So that, I think that was what actually allowed me to feel comfortable with being on a budget. Can I ask you how much you were making a month? As a professional player? A million a year. Oh, there you go. That's, that's not bad. <laughs> a million a year and 60000 in expenses. That's pretty smart. Yeah. That's pretty smart. So, yeah, John, I basically live like a college student. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love yeah. it. Love it. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. Ryan just said he was making a million a year. And one issue that I've found with professional athletes is that they think they're making a million a year. But in reality, they're only making 500000 after taxes. So they're spending like they're making a million Ah, in reality, they're only making they're only taking home five hundred. So it's a it's a psychological war game that they have on a regular basis. But the last part of the of the of the plan, and I'll leave investments to the side because that's definitely part of it. But I think that's that's so secondary. The last part of the plan is the exit strategy, having the estate plan in place. Um, and right now, sixty five percent roughly people do not have a standard will. And that just causes all kinds of chaos. So organization, budget, and then an exit strategy, those would be the three basic components of a plan that we would in, that we would utilize. Do you have those points? What's that? Your will and all that? I do not have a will okay. or a trust. Ah. There you that's, go. That's, that's your, I have, your yeah, no, for today. Without a doubt, yeah. Yep. And I've, I've been approached. My financial advisor wants me to do that as well. Um, no, you know why? Yeah. It's because, in, you know, heaven forbid something happens. For with, sure. With your four-day rental units and all that stuff. Without a doubt. It's called probate, you know, and then they come yeah. after it. Yeah, yeah. And you lose everything. Even so, if they're tucked under my, my wife's name. 
Yeah. Even though Absolutely. even worse. Yep. And what do you say to that, John? Yeah, everything gets published in a newspaper. Your life becomes an open book to society to examine. Um, so you want to, Ryan? I would highly recommend. Yes. You, you swear and away your your, for your sure. estate plan. And that's why we have a corporations guy, Garrett Sutton, is own your own corporation. Mm-hmm. Is, is we want nothing in our names. Is, are, anything in our names, Kim? There's nothing in our names, no. And that's why when they publish everything, Kim and I are broke. And that's the way you want to look. My poor dad was always excited about, oh, my house is in my name, my car is in my name. But that's a poor man's attitude. And you know what else is interesting? Because I read this all the time in the newspapers, and, and they get very upset Oh, oh my goodness, look at this person here. Who We don't know who lives there because it's in a corporation. It's in an LLC. Somebody's being sneaky. Somebody's doing something underhanded. It's not sneaky or underhanded. It's smart. It's smart, and it's the law, and mm-hmm. it's a way to protect your assets. But for some reason, people are conditioned to think it must be in their name to be upfront and legal and all of that, and, and it's a real misnomer. Any comments on that, John? Yeah, no question about it. I've I could rattle off all kinds of client situations where things weren't titled properly, they didn't have a will or a trust, it ends up in probate, and then there's a huge legal fight. Creditors come out of the woodwork saying, no, I'm owed some of that property. It's an absolute mess, but it's very easy to tighten these things up just by having some proper guidance. And it's not expensive. And it's not expensive. Garrett Sutton would be a great resource for that. Yeah. People can go to Mac Financial at Outlook.com, M-A-C Financial at Outlook.com, and request a copy of your white paper, questions mm-hmm. to ask and what to look for when selecting a financial planner. What are some of the things you discuss on your white paper that's free to, to our listeners? Individuals should interview at least three financial advisors before they choose who they're working with. Get an idea of their philosophy, their process, their support staff, how they charge there's a lot of questions to ask. This is this is a very hopefully long-term relationship that you're establishing with somebody over a very very important. So, topic. Ryan, have you had good and bad financial advisors? I've only had one to this date, but I did interview five financial advisors and five agents. That's um, great. Wow. Yeah, what I was you, I was you... watching a, a program in L.A. L.A. of course, but there was this guy that was homeless and he's. He's taking his financial planner's course. And I said, I can't wait to take financial <laughs> advice from that guy. And Ryan, what did you find when you interviewed? Oh, I, find, I found some that were, like I said earlier, some that were like, listen, I can front you this money so you can go buy the, the nice watch or I can front you this so you can yeah. buy the car. And I settled on the guy that wanted – he wanted to me to learn what he did, and he was an open book. So I was like – I love finances. I want to know what you're doing with my money. Are you investing in the same things I'm investing in? Nice. And so that's mm-hmm. what clicked for me. It wasn't the, hey, let's go get a drink and let's go buy this. I've, I've actually had a financial advisor I met with in Florida, um, and he was talking about the cars and the money and the girls. And I'm sitting here like, listen, I'm about to get married. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's funny. It's like they want to relate with you. But at the end of the day, I want you to do your job. Yes, it's personal. Yeah. Yes, we talk on a monthly basis. But I want you to do your job. I don't, I don't need a friend. You know what I mean? I'm busy with what yeah, I'm yeah, doing, yeah. but I want to be able to talk to you person to person. Tell me how the market's going. Not be shy if I do want to pull money. You know, that was one of my biggest things back in August when I pulled some money out of the market. I felt comfortable to do it, you know, because my guy understood um, the risk, the reward, and my game plan. So the thing I'm hearing from you, Ryan, is you you jumped in and you got yourself educated and you Without learned about doubt. it and you yeah, took so action. And, there, there's yeah. guys in my locker room that have no idea what they're invested in, no idea what type of return, um, no idea about tax breaks, credits. And I'm just sitting here like, and you're going to trust a guy that you don't even know. Yeah. But well, he's got a hot chicken on a Ferrari. Yeah, Without yeah, a doubt. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sitting here like, there's a wealth of information on Google. Yeah. You can Google just about Google, any, and Google pick up a book. Google a good friend. Didn't and it still is. <laughs> yes, for That's sure. great. So, John, final words on the subject. I, what, what really stuck out when I, when I was listening to Ryan talk is that he was involved and he educated himself, whereas most people, I would probably say particularly pro athletes, they just turn it over to somebody and just hope for the best. And everyone does that, frankly. But Ryan took the time to get educated. He understood stood the terminology, and he, and he stayed involved in the process rather than just turning it over and walking away, and that is just so critical. And the idea that this stuff is too complicated or I don't get it, money's I don't understand money, 
Um, that's just a belief that's just mm-hmm. embedded in a lot yeah. of people, and, but it's not true. And I just have to say, I'm, we're very excited because we uh, we've launched a new product at Rich Dad online product, and you can check it out. It's called How to Manage Your Money. Just released, and it's exactly what you're saying, John. It's simple. It's easy. Beautiful. It's it's um, educational and it's entertaining too. So it's how to manage your money at Rich Dad. And I've been shot down, all this stuff, nearly died so many times. And I go to work in the downtown office of Xerox, and there's hundreds of people sitting behind little cubicles, like an egg crate. And that way, they don't want to take any risks. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. That's life to them. They go to that egg crate from 8 to 12, half an hour for lunch, then they go home. You know what I mean? Going shoot me now but anyways the point here is this we're talking about a financial plan which is different than what you invest in and the reason a financial plan is important is because we're all different we all have different strengths weaknesses education backgrounds needs families etc 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 and so one of the reasons I had to come up with a financial plan is because I was so stupid And when people say, well, how'd you get smart? Because I was stupid. You know, I lost nearly a million dollars in my first business. And when you're a million dollars in the hole, you need a financial plan. You actually need a financial plan. (laughs) You need a financial plan. So it's a different kind of financial plan. You need a financial plan, but then you also need within that an investment plan. I I understand, Kim. No, no, no. No, I'm just saying. But most people convince. I'm not arguing with you. (laughs) I'm not arguing with you. I'm just saying you you need a financial plan. And part of that financial plan is the investment plan. A lot Mm -hmm. of people think... The investment plan is the financial plan. There's or they two think if they make enough money, it'll 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 solve their plan. Yes. And the problem is their plan was screwed up. That's why their investments aren't working anyway. Correct. That's what happens when you don't have a financial plan. It's not what you invest in. It's that you're an idiot, and we don't know what to do with your money before you make your money. So our guests today are Ryan Broyles, former NFL player of the Detroit Lions, rookie of the year, and also dear friend John McGregor, financial planner author of the upcoming book, The New Science of Financial Transformation. Once again, the reason a financial plan is important is because we're all different. I didn't really start to shape up until I was nearly a million dollars in debt, and I realized I couldn't keep doing what I was doing. So that's when we, you know, when Kim and I were by, married by this time, and she couldn't believe how, how deeply in debt I was. It well, wasn't from spending. It was no. from losses in, in a business. Yeah, and I still remember sitting at the dining room table at our house in Portland, Oregon, and making this list. It was a long list of everybody that was owed money. And we just and, and we'd get wow. up the next morning, and Rob goes, oh, I forgot there's this other guy. Or, oh, I forgot there's this other company. And we just we, we made the list, and we paid them all off, little by little. Wow. It, was part of, it was part of our plan. The difference is being an entrepreneur. We had no paycheck. And to most people, the reason I tell you the story of those people that were sitting in the cubicles at Xerox, they have a different life. They need a different financial plan. As an entrepreneur, I can step on the gas pedal and make a lot of money really quickly. So by having to knowing I have the skills to make a lot of money, my financial plan or our financial plan was different than those people at Xerox sitting behind the cubicle making their 100000 a year. Yeah, because Betty, the bookkeeper, didn't actually like our financial plan because we no. took one of, the, one of our rules, and we still use it today, but it's, it's even a higher percentage. It's 30% of, any dollar, 30% of any money coming into our household. We took off the top and put it into a savings, uh, savings mm-hmm. account, investment account, and a tithing or charity account. Mm-hmm. She didn't like that plan because she wanted us just to pay our bills, but she didn't understand that we did as entrepreneurs have the ability to make money when we needed it. Yeah, we can step on the gas, make a lot of money pretty quickly. So that was the price of being deeply in debt. You know, it's kind of a mm-hmm. trade off there. So this is Ask Robert's most favorite part of our program. You can submit your questions to Ask Robert at richdadradio.com. So, Melissa, what's the first question for Ask Robert? Our first question today comes from Andrea in Tempe, Arizona. Favorite book, Unfair Advantage. She says, I want to interview a financial advisor. What would you say is the most important question to ask? Well, let's toss to John McGregor on that because he is a financial planner, and it's a good thing I wasn't your client, John, because you would have shot me along the way. <laughs> but anyway, what would you have to say? What, what's the What's the number one question, John? Uh, if I had to boil it down, I mean, there's so many questions, but if I had to boil it down to one question, just one question, this is tough, but I think the question would be, as a client, why should you be my advisor? And let the advisor answer the question. And if the, if, there, if the answer is all around money and investing and I've got a better investment than this and 
then that should be a red flag. But keep in mind, this is a relationship. So you really want to understand who that person is that you want to work with and, and basically entrust your financial life with. I think that would probably be where I would start. Okay. So, Ryan, what you, you, you interviewed five financial planners before you chose one. Mm-hmm. What were some of the pros and cons? Well, I definitely got a wide range of answers when I did ask questions. And I went with a guy that had the same ideas as me. So, for instance, my guy believed in tithing. I believe in tithing. So that was a big catch for me. He believed in um, not shooting for the moon but making a regular return. I believed in that. Um, I did not believe in, you know, saying I'm going to he's going to go out here and make this for me and I'm going to be the richest man in the world, which I had some people say that that's that was not my goal in life. My goal was just to be comfortable. And so that's how I got to narrow it down to the guy that I have today. So his today. philosophy and yours meshed. They, they mixed, yeah. for sure. Hey, John, should a financial planner be asking you a lot of questions as you're in, a, in the interview? No question. That is such a good question, Kim, because it is a mutual relationship. And too many times the financial advisor is trying to force themselves on somebody that Sell, sell, really sell, sell, sell. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. So I think it's it's imperative that, that the advisor is asking questions of the client. And I think that's a big red flag to the client, to the individual. If the advisor isn't interviewing the client, just as the client should be interviewing the advisor, that's a red flag. Because I think the advisor needs needs to make sure that they're a right fit for that client as well. So I want to say this one more time. The plan is more important than the investment. But what most people don't have is they don't have a plan and they think investing and making a lot of money, like flipping houses and all that, is a plan. That's a plan to go broke. You know, or I'm, I'm just going to buy a lot of real estate. That's a plan to go broke because, as John talks about, you've got other structural things to put in place, like a will. And what what other things you have to have in place, John? Insurance and stuff like that. Well, insurance possibly, depending on your situation. Um, and I wouldn't get too complicated with these insurance policies. Most of the time, you should just have some term insurance if that's what you need. And then and then in the estate plan, uh, a will and even a trust in many cases and some powers of attorney would be very important to have. Also, what we're talking to Ryan is asset protection, you know, making sure that the moment you have money, you're a lawsuit, you know, one step away from a lawsuit. And those are very part, very important parts of your plan, not just making money or flipping houses or playing the stock market or playing the ponies or going to Vegas. That's what most people are doing, and their plan is going to be a plan for disaster. So next question, Melissa. Our next question comes from Lindsay in Australia, favorite book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. The question is, how can I get ahead when I'm earning over $100,000 but can't afford a deposit on a house? That's a very good question because obviously she doesn't have a very good plan. So, John, as a financial planner, what do you think? She's uh, hundred thousand is quite a bit of money, except it's in Aussie dollars now. But anyway, because of the China crash. But anyway, uh, what would you say to somebody like that? Well, I'm kind of skeptical when I hear this because I want to know where her money's going. It sounds yeah. like just my immediate assumption is that she's spending money frivolously, and so that's probably priority one is getting your arms around her spending so habits. It's a budgeting issue right away, right? No question. Absolutely. Yep. Boils down to budgeting. So Ryan, what would you say to her? You have You're, a budget, you right? Had, you yeah. Had, yeah, you were the have a king of budgets. You're, you're making a million dollars a year, but you have a budget. You had a budget. Without a doubt. Yeah. yeah. So, and, the, um, and the guys who don't have budgets are broke. Yeah, and you got to hear. You, got, you guys got to hear this. He was making a million dollars a year, and his expenses were 60000 a year. That's what you kept it to. Yeah. That's Yeah, so initially I did not want to spend as much as I made. You know what I mean? I feel like a lot of people get into that situation. So obviously spend more you're than making a hundred thousand a year and you don't have any room to save, then that is a budgeting situation. So um uh I believe in the eighty, thirty, twenty rule as well, or even in some instances just ten percent savings a month. Because unlike a lot of people that do have a W two or employee job, they can't save more than ten percent because they're basically not making enough money. Uh, but as long as you have a savings, you have a plan to save a certain amount of money, you can get an FHA loan at 3.5% down. Not sure how it is in Australia, but I think it's manageable. Yeah, she's, she's if you make 100000 I think she can get it done. So well, what I what I always say is there's three types of advisors out in the world today. There's you know Susie Orman, and she advises poor people. You have Dave Ramsey is middle class, and you have Rich Dad, which is rich. 
But the reason Susie Orman is probably the fundamental, most basic one is she's not, when I say she's investing poor people, she's investing people with poor spending habits. For example, this person making $100,000 a year and not being able to put any money aside, she is the problem. So when I say Susie advises poor people, it's that they have poor budgeting problems, habits. And I, I think I think Lindsay's a perfect candidate for our new program called How to Manage Your Money that we just launched. I would say, Lindsay, go look at that product, go get that product, because I think that's going to help you get the get the house that you want. And we did the same thing Ryan did. I mean, we had the small house. It was a nice house, and it was in a great little resort area. Um, but we didn't spend more money on the bigger house. We got we kept that money and put it into investments. And then the yeah, investments that, eventually paid for the bigger without house. Without a doubt. Yeah, right? Yeah. Is that what you're working towards, Ryan? That is the goal, for yeah. sure. <laughs> yeah. So next question, Melissa. Our next question comes from Amir in Iowa. Favorite book, Midas Touch. It says, Robert, I'm a father of two and a husband at 23. Where should I start to build my wealth? I've read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, The Quadrant, and Business of the 21st Century. I want my family to have freedom, but where do I go? That's a fantastic question because that's what this program is about. Once again, I would contact John McGregor, M-A-C-G-R-E-G-O-R. His website is macfinancialatoutlook.com and request his white paper, questions to ask, and what to look for when selecting a financial planner because it starts with your plan. If you don't have a plan, you don't have much of a future. So, is, And as John's new book coming up, The New Science of Financial Transformation, coming out in 2016. So like Kim and I had a plan. You know, we, have, we had a budget. We knew how much money we're making. But the difference is, for Kim and I being entrepreneurs, we have the ability to make a lot of money quickly. So that was also part of our plan. We had no money at first. And the reason we never got a job is because somebody would always tell us how much we could make. So by being entrepreneurs and just stepping on that gas pedal when we need money, it's really easy to make money t- today. But those are choices you make in education. Any comments on that, Ryan? Well, yeah, I think um, with his question, he I think he needs to figure out what his game plan is. You yes. know, financial freedom, independency looks different for everyone. But who is he? Yeah, well, exactly. I mean, is, yeah. is he, he going to try out for a wide receiver at Detroit? I don't think so. You know what I mean? It yeah. might be the right time for him. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think he just has to understand who he is, like yes. you said, uh, exactly. and what his, his goals are for him Best and his family. Advice, who are you? Yeah, and what so you? he will know which ways to attack what works for him and, and grow from there. We have less than a minute. John, final comments. What would you say to this guy? I mean, he's got, you know, besides find out who you are. To echo your points, I would just say get started. Find out what's deeply meaningful to you, what you really enjoy, whether it's copy, real estate, stocks, uh, snowboarding, whatever that passion is of yours, and you'll figure out a way to make money around that passion. Right. So that's what I would do. So final words, Kim? Well, I, I just want to thank Ryan and, and John for being here on the program because this is really a crucial, crucial topic. And, you know, Robert and I didn't – we didn't certainly didn't write the book on financial planning. We did things a little backwards. Um, but we did financial have... desperation. <laughs> <laughs> but we did follow certain rules. And one thing I want to say to Amir and, and also to Lindsay, who was talking about the house, I mean, we did have a very simple rule. And it was that 30 percent off the top. With every dollar that came in, we took 30 percent off the top. 10 percent went into a savings account. 10 percent went into an investment account. And 10 percent went into a tithing or charity account. And that made a huge difference for our future because that money we were setting aside to build our future. And that's what we used it for.